Welcome everyone. We're so glad that you can join us for this month's edition of Startup Advisor Lunch and Learn series. Thank you for joining us online because of the snowstorm. Uh, we don't have an in-person option today. Um, SP3 Northwest is the host of Startup Advisor Lunch and Learn, and SP3 Northwest is Washington State University's business incubator. We are an early stage support system for um, early stage technologies and scalable technologies. We have a variety of programs in order to wrap around those startup founders uh, that we call members. And that includes Startup Advisor Lunch and Learn, as well as Design and Engineering Roundtable, our summer networking event, Founders, Funders, and Friends, and a number of other programs to make sure our startups are successful. We welcome you here. If you would go ahead and advance to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so this presentation and normally the in-person delicious lunch is made possible by our Q1 sponsor. Uh, Keith Lahanta has joined us and he's with Sales Acceleration and Pivot Sales Solutions. And we are delighted to have him as one of our service provider network members. Next. A little bit of housekeeping. This presentation is recorded. A polished up version will be posted to our social channel, most likely next week. And if you would feel free to share about what you learned and your observations or connections that you made um, through the Lunch and Learn. We've got a hashtag SP3 Northwest LNL, um, and we normally go through LinkedIn um, Facebook and Twitter. So feel free to tag us there. Next. And with that, I am delighted to introduce to you Jamie Johnson and Allison Glazana of Perkins Coie who are going to talk about the legal aspects of business. And let me remove my spotlight and begin to spotlight them. Fantastic. I will go ahead and kick us off and introduce myself and then we'll let Allie introduce herself. But I'm Jamie Johnson. I'm a corporate attorney at Perkins Cooey in our emerging company and venture capital practice based in Seattle. I represent startups from inception to exit and particularly those who are raising money from VCs. And I've been practicing now for eight years, working with startups and investors, investing in startups that entire time all at Perkins Coie the whole time. And I also support the ecosystem in Seattle in, in a variety of ways, including participating in UW's Accelerator. I'm a mentor with the Jones Foster Accelerator as well. I'll turn it to Allie to introduce herself. Yeah, thanks, Jamie. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm uh, Allie Glass now. I'm um, counsel at, uh, at Perkins Coie. Um, technically, I'm based in the Seattle office, but as many of you know, I, I live in Spokane. Um, and I've been in this community um, for, gosh, almost six years now. Um, been in practice about a decade. Um, before um, becoming a patent attorney, I spent uh, about another decade um, in scientific research, um, predominantly gene therapy and cell therapy for pediatric oncology. Um, after my, my postdoctoral work, I, I did switch into patent law. Um, so I've been kind of on both sides of R&D um, uh, R&D work, and then representing startup companies. Um, I started my practice at uh, Wilson Sonsini about 10 years ago um, and, and came to Perkins thereafter. Um, I've been here, gosh, um, about eight years now. Um, I did take a two-year hiatus. I went in-house. Um, I came back to the firm a little over a year and a half ago. Um, during that, uh, that time in-house, I had joined a company called Sana Biotechnology, um, joined them pre-IPO and took them through IPO um, representing most of their cell therapy patent portfolio. Um, shortly after IPO, I, I came back and rejoined um, rejoined the firm. So, um, and have been been here um, since, representing mostly life sciences uh, startup companies. Awesome, thanks, Allie. Well, before I dive in, I also want to share. I mentioned I'm a corporate attorney. What that really means in practice is that I kind of quarterback whatever legal needs startups have, and that means connecting startups and founders to legal and other services 
throughout the life cycle. And that's in my focus, outside of my focus, in our law firm, outside of our law firm. And I frequently refer um, founders to other legal service providers, accountants, et cetera, and view our role in general as just trying to help you find the right resources, even if that's not from us, but if you're familiar with Perkins, um, per Perkins is a full spectrum law firm with a pretty large domestic presence, some international presence. We were founded in Seattle and we're representing tech startups like Boeing and Amazon from their inception. We provide a wide range of services in corporate and IP and Ali will, will be focusing on IP today, but we have deep benches and other specialties. And so it's it helps us, we're I think uniquely positioned to grow with companies as they grow throughout their life cycle. And our discussion today, we only have an hour, so it's really designed to be a, a starting point. And there's a lot that I won't be covering today, even on the financing side that I would love to talk about. So happy to have conversations with folks one-on-one. -on -one. I think we'll be able to chat for a little bit after today's session, but feel free to drop questions in the chat and we'll do our best to answer. But I would love to, to chat with you guys one-on-one -on -one too. Go ahead, next slide, Allie. Sweet, so you have an idea, what's the next step? It's most likely forming a company and why that is, I mean, there's a lot of reasons, but the big ones are to protect your idea and your IP. Ali will be talking more about that, but you can think of the entity that is the company as a container and you want to put everything in the container and make sure the ownership is within that. That entity allows you to protect yourself from personal liability. So as a, a founder, that's beneficial. It also is a signaling mechanism to investors and signals that you're ready. If you're not formed, they certainly won't invest and then you'll be racing to form your company. There's some tax benefits. I'll touch on them throughout the presentation today. It's an area I dabble in a lot. I'm on the phone with my tax partner probably every day, um, but there's some benefits to founders for doing that early. And then the formation process forces the conversation of division of labor, division of equity, which I think can be easy to push off as you're focused on product development and technical parts of the business. But it's honestly one of the most important areas. And I'll, I'll talk about that in more detail in a bit. When I think as soon as possible, I can't think of a scenario really where I met with a potential client and they had an idea and I said, you should wait. I, I'm sure we could think of an example if I really tried hard enough, but it's it's pretty advantageous to form early. And that can be, you just have an idea. Um, when it's significant, I mean, you should actually form is when you have meaningful development, you wanna get the IP into the right entity. Um, when you're entering into commercial contracts, I mentioned the liability shield that you get. You certainly don't want to enter into contracts like that as an individual. If you're thinking of hiring someone, that's a good time to pause and consider forming an entity. And then raising money is the really big one. It's just a requirement. So I pretty much speak with companies who are, are interested in talking with us because they are looking to raise money. Um, but that also is often aligned with them having an idea. So it's generally pretty early where they are they just have an idea. They don't have really a product. Maybe they don't even have a beta or a pilot. They don't have employees. They don't have commercial contracts, but they know they're going to fundraise at some point in the next few months or kick that process off. That's a great time to form. Where? I'm, I'll keep it super simple. And Delaware is the option if you're if you're going to be raising money from venture capitalists. There's a lot of legal reasons for that that will totally bore you, but there's some efficiencies that you would appreciate in deal efficiencies, legal efficiencies, and certainty given their robust case law, but investors uh, prefer it. And in this, in this entire framework in the venture capital space, you really don't want to scare away investors or do something that is creative in this way. There are other areas to be creative, but um, Delaware entity formation or state of incorporation is certainly not an area. It's probably going to be a C Corp. I'll talk more of that about that on the next slide, but there are significant benefits to forming um, C Corps from the tax perspective, but VCs will almost always require it with some limited exceptions. Next slide. Thank you. I've listed the type of entities to choose from here, and you could think of them really in three buckets, but we're probably only, if you're a startup and raising VC funds, talking about C-Corps. The first are nonprofit entities. 
Um, the second are flow through entities. And then the third are corporations. And the tax treatment is what the C signifies or C corps. They're also S corps, but that's a flow through. If you're planning to raise money from VCs, you probably need to be a C corp. And that's because a lot of those VCs require you to be a C corp because of who their LPs are. On the tax side, there are significant tax benefits. The one that I'll, it's worth me mentioning, not going to talk about it a ton, but it is something you could, you should Google and get familiar with if you're not. And we have great blog posts, by the way, plug to our startup blog, Startup Percolator that has founder tips. There is a great founder tip on this one called Qualified Small Business Stock, QSBS for short, but both founders and investors care a lot about this. It's only available for C Corps. And it means that founders, investors, if your stock meets certain qualification, the big one being your, your corporation has under 50 million in gross assets, your stock is not subject to capital gains tax up to $10 million or 10X your basis. So it's a massive benefit that everyone cares about and it's only available to C Corp. So that's a big driver. If your goal is not to fundraise, and I feel like someone maybe posted a question on this in the chat, but if your goal is not to fundraise and you want to bootstrap, you have more flexibility, especially at the early stages, you can consider LLCs if that's advantageous from a tax perspective for your personal tax situation. But if you think at some point you're going to raise money you are going to have to, I mean, you will very likely have to convert to a C Corp. And that conversion at the early stages is very easy. I've done it a bunch when it's right after formation. Once you bring capital in, it becomes really complicated and can stand in the way of getting capital in the door. One of them took us six months because of the company had a 30 year history of, as an LLC. So it has to be, the LLC has to be done right. LLCs are purely contractual, they're messy. So you'd have to get the conversion right. So I, I say it's doable, it's just not beneficial. It, it generally requires a lot more work. How to form a company? This is probably most important to you all who are founders on the call. I suggest working with law firms who work in the venture space. You can certainly do it outside of that. And if that's the case, um, I recommend loosely an online resource called Clerky. There's also LegalZoom, which has, I've seen their documents and those are okay. Um, the reason why you want to make sure this is right and you want to invest upfront and in making sure it's right is these, if there are any issues with formation, they're very difficult and expensive to fix. And particularly on the tax side for the founders, there are some things you just can't clean up. If you don't file an 83B election, which it taxes your shares at formation, which they're worth $0 at formation. So you pay zero in tax significant tax consequences if the startup does well for the founders. And, and investors don't love that because they're worried the founders will leave. It's just a huge issue. And I even see folks miss that using services like Clerky. And so um, most, most law firms who work in the venture space do, do formations on a, a very low cost basis because it's worth everyone's time and investment to make sure it's done right. And we don't want to be a a barrier to making sure that it's done right. So we're pretty flexible on making that happen efficiently and quickly. In fact, all of our docs now are generated using a generator because they're so form space. So it's pretty efficient. Next slide, please. Um, building out your founder team is super important. This, the formation process I mentioned earlier kind of forces you to have these conversations about who's on the team, what's your role, the team matters from an investor perspective, from a business point of view. They want to understand who they're investing in and what each individual owns in the company. So you want to think about who your teammates are. Friends and family, are they you know, best co-founders? Maybe. Could they be good angels? Maybe. So these are just things to think about. What are the investor optics of that? Investor optics are super important. I feel like half of my job in VC deals is just managing optics and making people feel comfortable. These are risky investments. You, you really want to make sure that the, the team, um, team is strong, demonstrates commitment to the business, 
investors want full-time founders unless who are working day to day on the business really and but unless you have a end date in mind from your moonlighting and you you know that your end date's coming up at say Microsoft or something like that but otherwise that's what they'll expect to see next slide please as part of the formation process um you'll discuss equity splits and this can be really hard for founders especially if you're close with your team and you haven't had this conversation you've been working on an engineering idea for a couple of years. I see this out of the Jones Foster Accelerator, for example, where students were working together in a class and it turned into a startup and there are seven people involved and they're like, How, who's, who's really sticking with this thing? So this is a list of questions. It's not totally comprehensive of, of questions that can help you prepare for having a conversation with your co-founders around equity splits. Like, should it be equal? Probably. Probably not. That's pretty rare, actually, that it's really equal. But it's emotional. There's an element of fairness at play. People want to feel compensated. <clears throat> so it's um, important to have this conversation and then document the equity split, not just in an Excel table, but by issuing the stock. And that's really where, if you find yourself in this position where you've maybe even formed the entity, but you haven't issued the stock, that's where you'd want to stop and say, how can we best do this? It's probably working with a law firm who who, do, who does this work, it's easiest to take care of those two pieces at the same time. The longer you wait to issue stock, there's some tax and in corporate governance implications to that. But so this is a good time to kind of stop and consider working with counsel instead of just doing it on your own. And if you've already issued stock and you're not happy with founder allocations and you're looking back, it's tough to change, not impossible, but from a tax perspective, it's really inefficient. So taking the time up front, even taking a couple of months to make sure you have a cap table you like, the vesting schedules that you like, the incentives are aligned, the team is aligned on, well, who, who's an officer? You know, who's really running this thing? Who's going and pitching to investors? All of these pieces to thinking about issuing equity should be a part of your, your conversation early and then you should document it. And I continue to suggest, by the way, working with counsel because um, as startup attorneys, we're, our job is not to generate more legal work and create problems. It's really, and, and this is like our business practice is dependent on this working well and being flexible startups, setting them up for success so they can grow. So they're not spending their cash on working with lawyers. So there's a lot of upfront investment in startups and, and working with counsel who are supportive of trying to set you up structurally at the beginning in the right way so that you can we can get out of the way and you can grow your business. Next slide. So Allie knows a lot more about IP than I do and she'll be talking more about this, but I did wanna just mention a couple of things as they tie into formation. Um, IP is super broad. At, and from my view, it's it's know-how, it's pitch deck, it's business plan, it's marketing materials, especially at formation if you're at idea phase. That's pretty much all it is. And the founders, in exchange for their stock, assign the IP related to the business. So all of the things I just mentioned, we usually attach pitch deck, for example, to the founder documents. And that IP assignment looks all the way back in perpetuity. So everything gets into the container. And that's a standard form that should be should be entered into an exchange for stock. And then all I, all employees, including founders, assign their inventions moving forward. So any work you create related to the business moving forward is also assigned. So there are two documents, generally speaking, at formation that you sign to get everything into that bucket. Next slide. So there are a lot of things I, I didn't touch on today that, um, and fundraising is probably the most important. This is but this could honestly be a whole hour and maybe a couple of hours over a couple of days talking about fundraising for startups. But um, I certainly suggest fundraising uh, through council and not just downloading Y Combinator safes and issuing them. You can sell your company out from under your feet without even knowing it. And especially with their current documents. So um, I, I think it's always worth a conversation with someone who does this day in and day out. There are also securities law implications to fundraising that are easy to comply with, but you just have to know the gotchas and you have to prepare. Other areas where you should sort of stop and think, do, do I need help? Th these are the material areas. And these are areas that I quarterback help on on a weekly basis, hiring and firing employees, 
especially C-suite folks and negotiating their documents, um, understanding tax implications, the 83B election that I mentioned, qualified small business stock. There are other, as you start issuing options, restrict, restricted stock to new hires, for instance, there are ways to structure those um, awards that will matter to your employees and you should understand. And then governance and hygiene, which is really kind of board relations and um, corporate governance, which matters to investors, especially as you grow. Commercial agreements, I'd say loosely, but over time for sure, depending on how material they are. And then protecting your IP and working with counsel on IP strategy, because it's super, super important to investors in fundraising. So with that, I will kick it off to Ali to talk more about IP. And I do see some questions in the chat and I hope to come back to them at the end here. Yeah, Jamie, there's a couple that maybe we tackle real, real quick on the corporate side. I think um, one from Mark about founder agreements. Can you read it to me? Yeah, would you recommend founder agreements to guide resolution of possible inter-founder issues later? Um, the At the early stages, we don't typically enter into voting agreements. And one reason is, and, and that's really what a founder agreement is. And one reason for that is those are heavily negotiated by venture capitalists. So they'll just totally be undone as soon as you start raising venture capital funds. But if you're not going the VC route, I think that's something to consider, particularly around agreements, more so around governance. Who's on the board? How does how is that? how is that makeup affected by ownership? If a, if a founder leaves the company, for example, should they really be able to elect the board? Does that make sense? So those are the types of things I think about, but you don't see it a lot unless there's, unless something's not really going well in the VC space. Um, and then another one about um, anything specific a university spinoff must be aware of or keep in mind. I have a lot of IP specific remarks on that that I will address yeah. as I go. But before we switch gear into IP, is there anything corporate wise that um, a university spinoff should keep in mind? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. And I work frequently with university spinouts. On the equity side, you want to think about normally universities get common stock and they're very Universities, because if they're state agencies in particular, are very uh, resistant to signing contracts from deal to deal. So as you fundraise, if they hold a large percentage of, they could, percentage of the company, they could be a blocker. I think you normally see 3 to 6%, depending on your industry and the market of ownership. But some universities do negotiate anti-dilution protection. So they get to keep that 6%, say, through certain rounds, including a safe round or a bridge round all the way up until your priced round. So it's helpful to understand the equity piece. What do they have? Is it just truly 6%? Is it common stock? Is there anti-dilution protection on that? Is that negotiable? If not, maybe can we bump up royalties in lieu of equity? There's some levers that you can pull with universities to try and mitigate the equity ownership. Thanks, Jamie. We have a few more specific questions about kind of costs, right? Questions to ask firms transitioning from LLC to C Corp. Maybe we tackle some of those at the end because I think there could be some kind of IP commentary in there as well. Awesome. Okay, great. Um, we'll shift over to IP um, and kind of talk about um, IP as a whole. There's a lot of different buckets of IP. Um, and then focus mostly on patents. That's typically where um, where companies have um, most of their asset creation tends to be in patents as they're a, a bit more of a um, monetizable asset in these, these early stages. Um, most of my comments as we talk about IP, I'm gonna try and tailor them to very, very early stage companies, particularly ones that are university spin outs or institute spin outs um, and usually have some sort of a license agreement with the university for IP that may have been created during their tenure at the university. Um, but my, my clientele ranges from universities themselves to their spin outs to small companies all the way to large pharmaceutical companies. So um, a lot of the IP considerations will vary based on the size of the, the business um, and the, the stage of the business. Um, so if you have specific questions, please feel free to put those um, in the in the chat. Um, but overall, kind of regardless of regardless of the stage of the business, the type of business or the line of industry that you're in, IP is an asset. Um, it does a number of things for your business. Um, in addition to creating brand awareness, it does give you a competitive advantage 
Um, there is a form of exclusivity that largely ties into the patent space, um, but can also be acquired through trade secret generation, copyrights, and um, trademarks. Um, it does tend to foster investment in the company from outside sources, um, oftentimes too within your own employees, especially if the IP that they own is assigned to the company. Um, it, can, it can help with um, retention and continuing to further develop um, company assets. Um, one other um, angle is with respect to revenue stream. While, um, while having IP um, can, can cost a company, right, to license it if they, if they need it to operate, um, it can also create additional revenue streams. So you can outlicense um, any, any IP that you have to um, in very strategic, very strategic ways. Um, the um, different types of IP that exist, there's four main buckets, trademarks, copyright, trade sequence, and patents. Um, the one that um, most folks tend to be most uh, familiar with is trademarks. These are the words or logo that identify a source of goods. Um, the two main um, purposes of trademarks is to protect consumers, um, so you know what you're buying and from whom you're buying it. It also prevents um, different owners of brands um, and the owners themselves from a misappropriation um, or creating you know, knockoffs or whatnot um, in, in other circumstances and passing them off as, as their own. Um, trademarks are enforceable in the court system as well. So um, in the situation that 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 um, a potential knockoff would arise, those those can be enforced. Um, copyright protects works of works of authorship. Um, these are a large bundle of rights. So they give you um, protection around copying of your work, others displaying it, performing it, modifying it, and then to some extent creating derivative works based on your original work. Um, this one is a bit unique in that the rights do vest upon the initial creation, um, so you don't necessarily have to register for a copyright. Um, they just they come into existence when the work when the work is um, created. However, if you do want to enforce your copyright against somebody, you do actually need to take the step of, an, of registering it, um, and then enforcement would happen in the federal court system. Um, there is no examination right on your copyright. There's a presumption of validity. Um, with your copyright, and if someone were to um, violate your copyrights that you have on your work, um, you would get damages um, based on the statutes and then attorney's fees for having to enforce that. Trade secrets um, are essentially the confidential information of the company. Um, early stages uh, of company formation, there, there's quite a, usually a, a hefty amount of trade secrets that exist. Um, one of the more common ones that folks are familiar with is the recipe for Coca-Cola. Um, the type of protection that is important to protect your trade secret is, is um, generally within your company. So it's um, access to information within the company is limited to those who, um, who need to have it for the purposes of doing their job um, and, a, and a variety of other different protections that, that can come into play. Um, trade secret protection is not something that you register for. It's something that you enforce within your company. Um, and it is provided to you and um, so long as that information remains confidential. So the to the extent it, it gets leaked, however it gets leaked, um, that trade secret is, is no longer protected. Um, the last one that we'll spend most of the time on is, is patents. Um, and these are um, a, a vehicle that is created by jurisdictional governments to protect inventions. Um, it is considered a property right they're territorial. So there is no so-called international patent. If you want a patent in the United States, you apply for one in the United States, same with Japan, China, um, so on and so forth. The one instance where they can get a bit confusing, and I'll talk about that in a couple of slides, um, is with, with Europe. You do get a European patent, and then you choose the different European, um, you do choose the European countries in which you would like to have that European patent enforced in. But for the most part, they are country by country. One thing to keep in mind is every single country is going to have unique laws regarding what they consider patentable subject matter um, and some other nuances around prior disclosures um, that, that I'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, patents give you exclusivity around your invention. So once you have a patent granted, you can prevent others from making, using, selling, or importing into the country that you have that protection in. On the flip side though, it doesn't give you a right to actually practice your invention. So for example, if you're working with something that's regulated by FDA, 
um, getting a patent on that particular drug or gene therapy or cell therapy doesn't allow you to go treat patients, right? You need an actual regulatory clearance. Um, I'll talk about this in a few slides, but having a patent does not necessarily give you freedom to operate. So you may have a patent, but it may overlap with a portion of somebody else's patent. Practicing your patented invention could potentially infringe someone else's patent. So there's there's another angle um, to, to freedom to operate um, that needs to be considered as well. Um, the, the world is now on a comprehensive first to file system. Um, pardon me, that change happened about 10 years ago. Um, patents are now generally awarded to the first party to file an application for that patent. Um, there are two types of patents. Um, uh, internationally, most countries offer the utility patent, which has approximately a 20 year term. Um, there are some ways in which you can extend this by a handful of years, but they're fairly nuanced. So for, for most purposes, it's a 20 year patent term. Um, and this is on a, a, a useful invention. So a composition of matter, a method of making it, a method of using it. Design patents would be around the appearance of something. Um, these have a 15 year term from the date that it's granted. Um, one of the more famous design cases was an Apple Samsung, and that was around the user interface appearance of the, the iPhone software um, on the screen. And that one, I want to say the final, the final decision was around 300 million um, for, for a design patent, and that was a single patent. Um, so design patents can be quite powerful, and they are a fairly overlooked form of patent protection. Um, the holder of the patent is the one that is required to monitor for potential infringers. The court doesn't go out and look for folks that may be infringing your patent. Um, so that, that is on um, the holder of the patent right. Um, but when infringers are discovered, you can take them, you can take them to court um, and, and enforce your patent if you choose to. Um, one of the biggest questions we get is when to file. Um, these patent, having a having a patent application pending or um, a granted patent is often a critical um, asset that investors are looking for. And there's a variety of different things that you may wanna consider. Um, public disclosures are fatal to patent applications. So if you have made a public disclosure regarding your invention, generally speaking, you cannot patent that. Um, the United States offers a one-year grace period where um, if you publish a manuscript, you send a non-confidential -conf deck to an investor or a potential investor, um, a variety of different uh, different ways of public disclosure could happen. In the US, you've got a year to essentially say, my mistake, I'll file a patent application. That is not true in many foreign countries. Almost all of them will not recognize that. Um, so before public disclosures are made, patent applications must be filed. Um, what counts as a disclosure is something being in public use, on sale or offered for sale, or otherwise being available to the public. So what we typically see where this happens is a manuscript being submitted for publication, reviewer says, or whatever journal says, we will we will publish this um, end of end of the month. It comes out early, and you don't get your patent application filed in time. You submit or present a poster at a conference, um, even unless the conference is fully under NDAs, it's considered public. Um, abstracts being submitted to conferences, abstract book publishes on publishes online. These are all public disclosures. Um, I mentioned pitch decks. This is one, I just had a client do this yesterday, actually. Um, you receive a copy of a non-confidential pitch deck, the invention's disclosed in there, patent application's not filed, that's a disclosure. Um, so now that, that client is looking at US-only protection. Um, you can have confidential versions of your pitch deck that is not considered a disclosure. Um, so that's public disclosure is usually our biggest driver and why you might consider to file and, and when. The other reason is investment. Um, often investors want to see patent applications at least pending, um, or if you have a reason um, to commercialize your invention because of this offer for sale, um, you may need to file. Um, a variety of factors kind of go into what goes into your patent application, but one of the big, the big um, things is ensuring that your invention is ready and largely complete. You wanna balance the sufficiency of disclosure and not necessarily rush to file it until the invention is, is ready. Um, one of the ways we can do that is with, um, one of the ways that we can do that is with provisional applications. Um, that is one type of application you may file. The provisional application establishes a filing date for the invention. It does not mature into a patent. It is not examined. It's essentially your flag in the sand to say, this is the date that I invented my um, technology. 
you have 12 months from the day that you file your provisional to convert it to an examined application. Within those 12 months, you can make changes. You can add to it. You can't necessarily take away. So we generally file the bare bones as a provisional application. They're generally less expensive. And then within 12 months, you generate new data, you refine different features of the invention, you realize you thought you could use one material for your particular component and you change it to something different, you can make those changes. Um, and then when that 12 month clock is up, you would file the application that's examined. In the US, it's called a non-provisional. Um, it's looked at by our patent office Depending on the technology, it's about 32 months to issue. Um, life sciences tends to be slower. Some of these can be upwards of six years, depending on how complicated it is. Um, high tech tends to be faster, even faster than 32 months. Um, there are mechanisms to expedite this down to 12 months, but they are very costly. Um, I think it's a $5,000 fee on this, this new schedule, um, just at the outset to, to kick off the, the faster examination process. I did say there's no international patent, and that is true, but there is an international patent application, um, and that's called a PCT. So um, there are 156 different countries that participate in what's called a PCT application. Most clients file PCTs because you often want patent protection in more than just the United States. With a PCT application, um, you can file that, and then you've got up to 30 months to choose which countries you actually want your patent in. So this puts a placeholder down, it delays costs, um, and then you choose at the end of that time which countries you wish to enter. You cannot change the content of the application within those 30 months, though. So what you file on the PCT is what you get to move forward with. Here's a timeline of kind of what this looks like. Um, clients will typically file a first provisional application. You have 12 months to refine it, and then you file your PCT or your non-provisional. Six months later, this publishes and becomes available to the public to review. Then there's about 12 additional months to decide which countries you want to enter your PCT in, and then examination begins. Most countries, US included, are 18 to 24 months for examination before you find out if your patent's actually going to issue. Um, there are a variety of different other applications you can file based on the same one. And this is something that we use for um, protecting various pieces of the invention and kind of building the Venn diagram around your technology. That 20 year time frame of protection starts when you file. So however long it takes to grant, your time that you have a, a, a patent in force and available um, is shortened by how long it takes to get it to, to move forward um, through the patent offices. Um, with patents, um, with patents, one of the big things that we see coming up, especially in startups and folks that are forming companies based out of universities, is the question about authorship and inventorship. Um, and this is a, a large point of distinction between the convention of authorship and inventorship. Usually in conference uh, poster presentations, manuscripts, there's a custom that's afforded by listing who is an author on that technology. Um, it's a public acknowledgement and most of your contributors, if not all of them are typically listed. That is not true on a patent application or a patent. Inventorship is a very strict legal determination and we focus on the claims of the technology when we're deciding who's an inventor. Very rarely are the same number of authors like on a major paper, um, equivalent to those as an inventor. Usually the corresponding inventors is a far, a far shorter list. Um, and the folks that become inventors on patents are those that conceive of the idea. They have a clear idea of what the invention is. And then they participate in reducing to practice. Um, the folks that only reduce it to practice may be an inventor, but usually they are not. Being a like a pair of hands to, to follow someone else's direction and um, put the invention together um, usually does not rise to the level of being an inventor. Um, where inventorship becomes a large concern is once the patent grants, if inventorship is incorrect, like let's say three additional people are listed as an inventors but actually are not inventors, that granted patent is not valid, is not enforceable, and you cannot fix it. Um, same is true if you forget to place somebody on it. If you've only listed three people and there should be five, again, that patent is not valid. We frequently change inventorship during examination of the patent uh, application before it grants, and that's very common. Um, but Jamie was mentioning some emotional tie to things like um, equity ownership in a company. And this is on and kind of in my in my wheelhouse where we see the most emotion tends to be around inventorship. 
the last uh, the last ship is is ownership. Um, ownership is not necessarily the same as inventorship. So Jamie had mentioned the um, assignment, uh, assigning your IP over in your employment agreements. Um, the whomever the patent is assigned to is who owns it. That's usually the company. Um, very rarely is it owned by the inventors. Um, if you have an obligation to assign through a university, then it's the university who, who would own your, your patent. Um, and then who owns it? There are many situations where we have joint ownership. Um, inventors can be from different entities. So if you're um, with the university collaborating with a company, sometimes you may have universities and companies that co-own. Sometimes there's agreements between entities that can change ownership. Um, one of the, the um, other things that comes up often is um, patents are not, um, if you have joint owners, each company or each party owns the patent equivalently as a whole. You don't split a patent ownership 50-50. Um, and then, um, so each, each joint owner can control um, the patent, whether it's enforced or not independently. And usually we have separate agreements that um, have various clauses and terms that, that may, um, may outline that differently. But on its face, joint owners independently own it wholly together. <laughs> um, and then the other, the other thing that can um, introduce joint ownership is um, patents often have multiple claims, sometimes dozens. Um, conceiving of a single claim is enough to give you ownership of the whole patent. Um, so you don't have to think of, conceive of every aspect of the invention covered by all claims. One claim or even part of a claim is enough to make you an inventor of the full invention. Um, we mentioned employment agreements. These are your obligation to assign. You um, often will um, have that obligation arising as a term of your employment. We also do assignments at the end once patents have granted. Um, students is another question we see often, whether students are inventors and if they are, whom do they assign because they don't have the obligation to sign to the university necessarily unless they have an employment agreement. So thinking about whose time and resources are available, whether it was part of their coursework or part of their employment. Um, and then if you're collaborating with somebody else, whether it's another university or another company, um, you often have notice requirements about inventions. So make sure you're bearing those in mind um, as far as reporting um, inventions that, that arise from, from those collaboration agreements. Um, freedom to operate is something that comes up quite often. And a lot of folks believe that if you have a patent, you get the right to proceed with your invention. And that's not true. Um, it does give you the right to exclude others from doing it, but it doesn't give you the affirmative right to practice it. And we talked about some of the regulatory things that are involved with that. Um, the other thing is that others own patents that cover some aspect of your invention. And this starts to get us into freedom to operate, which is something that inv uh, investors may, may ask about as part of the diligence process. Um, another one that we, we hear often is folks believing that if they don't see a similar product on the market, can you assume you don't infringe a patent? And that is also a misconception and that many inventions are patented, but not on the market. So whether you know about a patent's existence or not, you can still be liable for infringing that patent. So before investing in a new product, um, if you're asking yourself some of these questions, start thinking about freedom to operate as early as you can and engaging with counsel to help you um, do those types of searches and analyses for your products. Reason being, in a really simple example, Henry invents and patents a car. Base car has four wheels, an engine, and a steering wheel. John discovers that adding a windshield to the car makes it more comfortable. And so John can patent a car with four wheels, an engine, a steering wheel, and a windshield. This is patentable. It's a change in what was out there that Henry had. But with these common features, John cannot make or sell his car without infringing Henry's patent. Henry's patent's broader than John's. So John can get his patent on his improvement, but he still needs a license from Henry to build and sell this vehicle. Um, the, the other aspect with um, patentability is whether or not the product is on the market. Um, many folks, folks question, since it's not on the market, is it patentable? And 
Um, whether or not the product is on the market is not really the test that we're looking at. We're looking to see if the invention is new and non-obvious. Um, when evaluating that, we're looking at prior at public disclosures of prior art and, and publications. So there may be technical literature, there may be patent publications, there may be blog posts or statements on the internet, other kind of similar products, but not exactly the same. All of those things weigh into whether or not your invention is patentable. So simply because not the same thing is on the market um, could translate into it still not being a patentable asset. And so working with, with patent counsel to understand what, it, what, um, what types of subject matter um, are patentable and then the various prior art considerations um, to, to establish that is, is also um, a, useful, a useful exercise. Um, patents are expensive, right? And But thinking about a patent or a patent strategy, is that something that the company needs? Um, that can um, weigh um, two ways. Some of the cons that, that folks consider are the costs, um, the risk of public disclosure, and we talked about that at the outset, for public disclosures before patents are filed, patent applications are filed, that is, that is often fatal. Um, and then just because you have the patent doesn't give you the right to practice the invention, as we talked about, you still need to understand whether you have FTO. The pros for a patent application or a patent is you do get protection from your, competi from your competition. You can list your uh, product as patent pending and you do have the right to enforce it. It does also give you negotiation leverage if you're trying to license something, for example. Um, it's very attractive to investors and gives value to the company. Um, it can also give you potential passive income through, um, through a license. And then circling back to the investor focus, um, two of the areas in the earlier stages that um, the IP team gets, gets fairly involved and in where we see a lot of questions from folks um, uh, looking to diligence companies is at least in their seed round, uh, potential investors are often asking about your patent strategy. Do you have anything filed or is something being drafted? If not, why? What's what's your plan and what are you thinking about moving that, um, that forward? They wanna know your story for patentability. What makes your technology unique? Why is it distinguishable? How are you gonna proceed with your patent? What sort of claim scope are you gonna get? They also wanna know, are you aware of your competitors? And then are you aware of their IP? And are you aware how broad it is or how narrow it is? What are the design arounds? Um, and how could it potentially be blocking for you? When you get to the next round and they're looking at private equity or venture capital, venture capital series A, they're starting to look at your portfolio. They wanna know how many applications do you actually have? Um, are, is it US only or are you global? If you're global, what geographic areas are you in? Do you have um, your intermediate manufacturing countries protected? Um, are your key products covered by issue patents or are they still pending? In the life sciences space, they're looking and asking regulatory questions in the interplay of the patent system and the FDA. They wanna make sure you've got no IP ownership issues. They don't want uh, some potential inventor coming out of the woodwork a decade later and asserting that they own um, one of the granted patents and it's not invalid. So they want to see that you've got inventor assignments are executed. If there's um, a license needed from any party, whether it's a university, that it's in place and that you're complying with the licensee's IP policies, particularly university IP policies. They can be quite lengthy. Um, and that um, all of that aside, they want to know that you understand your FTO landscape. Um, that's important if you've, particularly as we talked about, to avoid infringement. Um, but they often want to understand if um, your patents, um, the you don't end up getting any patents granted from your applications, do you still have freedom to operate and what, and what that looks like? Um, these questions can get um, fairly complex. And so making sure you've got IP counsel that understands your portfolio, the technology space and your competitors really well becomes key. Um, we had one of our clients um, about two years ago that just did a $250 million round um, based solely on um, uh, a lot of the IP ownership and the IP portfolio having global rights that ended up being key to being able to get to be able to get their round in um, um, some clean tech carbon tech spaces. So um, something we see come up very often and the questions that we, we see in diligence from investors um, tend to be fairly routine in these spaces, regardless of the technology, uh, the technology area that you're in. Um, so with that, I'll just leave a few selected best practices. 
Um, ensuring, again, that the IP agreements are in place, there's confidentiality and procedures and policy to protect your trade secrets um, and, and stewarding your new hires to ensure they're compliant with those. Documenting your inventions, have an invention disclosure form, even if you feel like your company is small and there's unlikely, uh, unlikely chances inventions will be um, developed you may surprise yourself. So ensure you've got a policy in place for those disclosure forms um, because there is a problem solution approach to IP. Anytime a problem is solved, IP is created. And whether that IP is trade secret or patentable or how to protect it is a different, a different question, um, but there are um, options to protect it. And the other thing with IP is it tends to be evolutionary, not always revolutionary. So subtle changes, small advances can be a uh, creation of IP. And then the question is how to steward that um, through. Um, ensure you're addressing those IP ownerships early on and that you've got those assignments immediately upon filing applications. Um, oftentimes people believe, and, and, and when while it is often true, um, that that folks you know aren't going to argue about IP ownership or whatnot, um, Money can do strange things, and we've seen a lot of people come out of the woodwork um, on assignments. And and once there is value created and recognized, um, people want their royalties on that. Um, so ensuring ensuring you've got your assignments and your agreements in play at the outset um, is is very helpful to mitigate against that. Um, then then lastly is the geographic patent scope. Um, ensuring that that you're considering geography with um, with your strategy, um, and it's it's very rarely just the U.S. Have a non-con investor investor presentation that your IP counsel has blessed, <laughs> um, so you're not risking public disclosures by passing that on. Um, uh, IP counsel is is um, really um, useful in in ensuring those protections are there, and oftentimes getting applications filed quickly. It's very rarely a bottleneck to being able to pass that along. Um, and then if you're doing FTO work and keeping track of what others are doing, keep a database, um, keep your records on that fairly clear so you can track um, who those competitors are and the status of their, their patents and applications. Um, that's something that the council frequently does um, as, as well for clients. But um, if you're not engaging with IP council yet, um, keep, keep track of, of which assets that you're, you're looking at. And that's what we have today. So um, I have the this slide up and we are um, available to take questions. Thank you so much. So um, I want to give one more shout out to our Q1 sponsor, Keep Lahanta and Sales Acceleration. Um, and as Ali and Jamie said, they've got a few minutes. Um, and if you want to stop sharing, um, that'll let the, the whole grid of people, in fact, I will um, stop spotlighting and that will help everybody be able to be seen. Um, and if you have questions, if you want to either raise your hand or um, hop on uh, with video on, um, we can go ahead and take some questions. There are some in the chat that we could tackle um, for you, Allie, starting with when do you get the patent pending? <laughs> That's a fun one to be able to say. So patent pending will tie into the day that your provisional patent application is filed. Um, you, can, you can assert patent pending at that time. Um, sometimes when you say patent pending, folks will ask to see a copy or want to know the serial number of that. Um, provisional applications are still confidential, so it would be, uh, we usually recommend you don't share copies of that until the, the PCT or the, the U.S. non-provisional is filed, um, but you can still say you have a patent pending. Well, I think this is a, a good one. Um, is trade secret information disclosed to authorities or is it just strictly in-house? Yeah, so that that is uh, it's gonna get your typical lawyer response if it depends, <laughs> and it's really gonna depend on what authority um, what authority is uh, possibly it being disclosed to. So, um, FDA is a, a an example of an authority that often gets quite a bit trades of trade secret information as part of the um, process to approve drugs, for example, or some some therapies. Um, and given the circumstances of that, it is still considered a trade secret. Um, but um, um, there are other government bodies that may, for example, publish um, all the information that they are um, they are given. So understanding 
what um, what the disclosure requirements are of that government body um, is is important um, is with respect to the trade secrets. We just got another in the chat, interesting one. As part of IP strategy, do startups ever deliberately make public disclosures of their IP for purpose of preventing others from patenting? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely they do. Um, and, and of companies of all sizes um, will we'll often do this. Um, the risk with it is if you ever change your mind and decide that you do wanna patent on what you disclosed, um, that is not something you can go back and recapture, even though you were the one disclosing it. So um, typically we can file really, fair, if, if the sole point of making the disclosure um, at the outset is to prevent others, sometimes we can file patent applications very cheaply um, to, to address that purpose. And then that at least gives you the opportunity um, to go back and try and patent something later if you would like to based on that application. Um, but yes, people will do blog posts, um, a variety of different ways to inexpensively and quickly make a disclosure. There's another one. If a patent is awarded in the U.S., that often becomes public information. Does that prevent or sabotage filing in other countries? If you did not file a PCT application or directly in those other countries, yes. So that's typically why we file PCT applications um, is a per progress through the United States examination and other countries will occur concurrently at different time frames. Some countries are very slow, like Brazil can be like 12 years. Um, but it um, at least they all have the same filing date and that filing date is tied to that PCT application. So um, once that PCT application is filed, you can enter in any one of the 156 participating countries. Um, and then if the patent is awarded in the US, for example, while your European application is being examined, that no longer sabotage or um, prevents uh, filing in those other countries on that same application. Um, regardless of the type of application you file to, and this is something that comes up as you build your patent portfolio, thinking very strategically about when you file applications on which part of the technology becomes critical. Because um, once your patent application publishes, um, it becomes public and it's prior art to your own future applications and those of other parties. So um, we tend to build, think about, especially for startups, um, you know, what's what's the the overall patent port portfolio need to look like, and how can we best build that for you? Whether it's your composition of matter patents first, your methods of using those compositions later, so on and so forth, um, can can really um, impact how you file and when you file. Um, and then ensuring you've got enough in your application to support the claims. So filing, for example, a method of curing Parkinson's disease. Um, if you file something on that and you don't have the data to show you can actually cure Parkinson's disease, that application is still going to publish. And let's say three years later, great, you've cured it. You're gonna have a heck of a time patenting that because of your own prior application that's now public. Um, so exercising some restraint in the scope of what you try and file on um, to ensure that scope aligns with uh, the data that you have in hand, for example, at the time can be really critical um, in ensuring you can get the types of claims that you wanna get um, across your portfolio. I know we're at mid time, Michelle, can we stay on if folks want to stay on or? So yes, I'm happy to let that happen. I do need to hop to a one o'clock meeting. Um, and so I will assign host and the 